26th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Numbers chapter 11 verses 25 to 29. The Lord then came down in a cloud and spoke to him. A reading from the book of Numbers. The Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. Taking some of the spirit that was on Moses, the Lord bestowed it on the seventy elders, and as the spirit came to rest on them, they prophesied. Now two men, one named Eldad and the other Medad, were not in the gathering but had been left in the camp. They too had been on the list but had not gone out to the tent. Yet the Spirit came to rest on them also, and they prophesied in the camp. So when a young man quickly told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp, Joshua, son of Nun, who from his youth had been Moses' aide, said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses answered him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the people of the Lord were prophets. Would that the Lord might bestow his spirit on them all. The Word of the Lord. There are a number of lessons in this reading. First, God wants us to share the load of ministry in an effort to increase rather than limit the ministry. Priests must be willing to give responsibility to deacons and parishioners. Deacons and parishioners must be willing to accept responsibility when given to them by the priest. Ministering to the church community is a shared responsibility so long as our community leaders are focused on honoring God with their efforts and not seeking to honor themselves. Moses fell into the hole of taking credit for bringing water from the rock, but it was actually done through the power of God, not Moses' power. We may want to take credit for bringing in the Vacation Bible School to our parish if it is successful, but the only reason we brought it to the parish in the first place was because the Spirit moved us to do so. The program was successful because the Spirit moved people to volunteer to be teachers, administrators, helpers, etc. The program's success belongs to God, not to the leader of the program. The leader of the program acted as the hands of God working in this world. We need to support our priests and leaders of ministries and never join in a rebellion against them. Every new pastor faces challenges from the community because half of the community wants to change things and half wants to retain the policies of the preceding pastor. People tend to choose up sides to attack or defend the new pastor, but fail to realize it is about the honor of God, not their own honor. This reading shows that Moses has now come to realize the truth. But Moses said to the young man, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Moses is essentially saying, Okay, Eldad and Medad weren't with the chosen members of the seventy elders, but they were doing the work of the Lord and should be commended for their efforts. In the Gospel of Mark, we hear Jesus' response to John's question. John said to him, Teacher, we saw a man casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not forbid him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon after to speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is for us. Psalm 19, verses 8, 10, and 12 through 14. The precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoice in the heart. The command of the Lord is clear. Enlighten the eye. Yes. 
precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The decree of the Lord is trustworthy, giving wisdom to the simple. The precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true, all of them just. The precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. Though your servant is careful of them, very diligent in keeping them, yet who can detect feelings? Cleanse me from my unknown faults. The precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. From want and sin especially, restrain your servant. Let it not rule over me. Then shall I be blameless and innocent of serious sin. The precepts of the Lord give joy to the heart. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The decree of the Lord is trustworthy, giving wisdom to the simple. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The statutes of the Lord are true, all of them just. By them your servant is instructed. Obeying them brings much reward. Who can detect trespasses? Cleanse me from my unknown faults. Also, from arrogant ones restrain your servant. Let them never control me. Then shall I be blameless, innocent of grave sin. God gave us ten laws to follow, and we call them the Ten Commandments. Many view the laws in a negative way. Oftentimes, people think of laws as preventing them from having fun. This view demonstrates our selfishness. Laws, on the other hand, are quite freeing. In this psalm, we see that laws, specifically God's laws, instruct us in righteous ways. God's laws warn us of potential problems that lay on the horizon of life. His laws allow us to see ahead and to see the potential problems caused by our sin. God's laws are guidelines that light our path in this life. In Psalm 119 we read, Through your precepts, laws, I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Following God's laws brings joy to our hearts and makes us appear wise to those around us because we don't seem to have as many troubles in our lives as they do in theirs. Those around us fail to recognize that by following God's laws, we avoid many conflicts. The fourth commandment tells us to honor our father and mother. As we see from paragraph 
2199 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the commandment extends to all those who have authority over us. Today, I drove through a residential area at 25 miles per hour, which was the speed limit. It would have been easy for me to ignore the city's speed laws and drive at a much faster pace, but that would have been selfish because I would have placed my wants and needs above the city who has authority over me. Such behavior could have resulted in the taking of a child's life who ran into the street in front of me. Such behavior could have resulted in me going over the double lines and hitting an oncoming car. Such behavior could have resulted in a traffic ticket. By following God's fourth commandment and honoring those with authority over me, I avoided the potential conflict of killing an innocent individual, causing a wreck, or earning a speeding ticket. To some, I would have appeared foolish and overcautious. To others, I would have appeared wise in following the law. The first group would complain the cops were picking on them by giving them a ticket because there was nothing on the road to inhibit the use of speed. The second group of observers would have recognized that my obedience to the law resulted in avoiding many potential conflicts. Examine the conflicts in your life, and I'll bet you can find the commandment you violated. James chapter 5 verses 1 to 6 The Misuse of Riches A reading from the letter of St. James Come now, you rich, weep and wail over your impending miseries. Your wealth has rotted away, your clothes have become moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and that corrosion will be a testimony against you. It will devour your flesh like a fire. You have stored up treasure for the last days. Behold the wages you withheld from the workers, who harvested your fields, are crying aloud, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and pleasure. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous one. He offers you no resistance. The Word of the Lord. It is important to point out that there's nothing wrong with being rich. This reading makes clear that wealth of this world is without value in the next. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourself treasure on earth, where the moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Wealth gained at another's expense is wrong. In this reading, we see additional wealth being gained by cheating the laborers of their wages. In Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 6, verse 10, we read, For the love of money is the root of all evils, and some people in their desire for it have strayed from the faith, and have pierced themselves with many pains. The wealth described in this passage is a wealth of pride and arrogance. It is a wealth of selfishness. Christians need to be charitable, giving not selfishly. This reading is a warning to all. Christians do not adopt worldly standards. Again, Paul tells us in the book of Romans, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. As you can see, a wealth of pride and arrogance would be retained by the owner to demonstrate their own personal power and abilities. If you are blessed with wealth, a good Christian wouldn't hoard the money. He would share it with those less fortunate. Maybe a share of your excess could be given to a soup kitchen or a food distribution center. Maybe your ability to acquire wealth 
was a talent God gave you so that you could earn money honestly, pay a fair wage, and share your excess with others. Therefore, your wealth, or the acquisition of wealth, would not be a prideful demonstration of arrogance, but an opportunity to demonstrate true Christian charity. At that time, John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow us. Jesus replied, Do not prevent him. There is no one who performs a mighty deed in my name who can at the same time speak ill of me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Anyone who gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ, amen, I say to you, will surely not lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were put around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than with two hands to go into Gehenna, into the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than with two feet to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than two eyes to be thrown into Gehenna, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. An actor plays the part of Jesus, and though no actor is worthy of such a role, it has been done so that we may understand and benefit from the life of Jesus. Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. Do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me, for he who is not against us is on our side. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye 
rather than having two eyes to be cast into a hellfire, where their worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be seasoned with fire, and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace with one another. Mark chapter 9, verses 38 to 48. A stranger worked miracles in your name, but whoever is not against us is for us. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. At that time, John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow us. Jesus replied, Do not prevent him. There is no one who performs a mighty deed in my name who can at the same time speak ill of me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Anyone who gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ, amen, I say to you, will surely not lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were put around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than with two hands to go into Gehenna, into the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than with two feet to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into Gehenna, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The Gospel of the Lord. The disciples were jealous of a man who healed in Jesus' name because they were more concerned with their own position and abilities rather than seeing the benefit in someone else's ability to free those troubled by demons. In the medical profession, we see many doctors who have chosen to specialize in a particular type of medicine. But why? Their goal is to help people live a healthier life. Some specialize in cardiology because of their understanding and skill when dealing with heart patients. Others specialize in general practice because of their ability to diagnose problems and when the need arises, refer the patient to another doctor. Both doctors have the same goal, don't they? A cure for the patient. Neither doctor is superior to the other, are they? In this reading, John is more concerned with his status rather than the casting out of demons. Christians should not let differences between them interfere with their common goal of eternal life. As Paul says in Romans 12, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us exercise them, if prophecy, in proportion to the faith, if ministry, in ministering, if one is a teacher, in teaching, if one exhorts, in exhortation, if one contributes, in generosity, if one is over others, with diligence, if one does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. Let love be sincere, hate what is evil, Hold on to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Anticipate one another in showing honor. People don't have to be just like us to be doing the work of the Lord. Just like the apostles, we cannot allow our personal ambitions to get in the way of building up the kingdom of God. Blowing out someone else's candle doesn't make yours shine any brighter.
This is a homily for the 26th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 9, verses 38 to 43, verse 45 and verses 47 and 48. We're now travelling with Jesus and his disciples on the way to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. As I pointed out last Sunday, the evangelist Mark frames this journey to Jerusalem with two miracles about the healing of someone who is blind. The first miracle is at Bethsaida in the north, and the second miracle occurs as Jesus and the disciples leave Jericho, which is just to the east of Jerusalem. Jesus and the disciples will have walked well over 170 kilometres. But in Mark's Gospel, this is more about an inner journey of understanding. And it has to be said that the disciples are slow learners. It's as though they were blind. And so those two miracles are the evangelist's commentary on what is happening during the journey. In Mark's Gospel, there are three main groups of people who appear in the story. Firstly, the scribes and Pharisees. Now, as a group, they're always hostile to what Jesus is doing and saying. Secondly, we have the crowd. They follow Jesus around, and time after time we read that they're amazed at what Jesus does or says. But as far as we know, they don't do anything about it. And finally, we have the disciples. As I've said, they're slow to understand. Or perhaps a little more accurately, their preconceived ideas about Israel's Messiah are a barrier to what Jesus is actually saying. Three times on the journey, in chapters 8, 9 and 10 of the Gospel, Jesus tells the disciples what awaits him in Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men. They will put him to death, and three days after he's been put to death, he will rise again. And on each of these three occasions, the disciples just don't get it. They just can't understand what Jesus is talking about. After the first occasion at Caesarea Philippi, Peter takes Jesus aside and starts to remonstrate with him. Jesus replies, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things but on human things. Last Sunday we heard the second occasion on which Jesus tells the disciples what awaits him, but again they failed to understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. But Jesus is aware that they've been arguing among themselves, and he asks what they were arguing about. They had been arguing about which of them was the greatest. So Jesus places a child before them as the image of true discipleship. Children weren't rated highly in the ancient world. They had no status or prestige, no rights or entitlements. So disciples shouldn't be arguing among themselves about which of them is the greatest. Discipleship is service, not lording it over others. So we come to today's Gospel. One of the disciples complains that a man who was not one of the twelve was casting out devils in Jesus' name, and because he wasn't one of the twelve, they tried to stop him. It would seem as though the twelve still haven't learned the lesson. They're still thinking in terms of privilege and authority. The disciples are less focused on the good being done, and more concerned about the fact that an outsider was seemingly usurping their prerogatives. They believe they should have the monopoly over the brand name of Jesus. It's as though they're saying, we're card-carrying apostles. We have exclusive rights to the Jesus franchise. No one else but one of us is authorized to cast out devils in the name of Jesus. 
but they receive a mild rebuke from Jesus. You must not stop him. No one who works a miracle in my name is likely to speak evil of me. Anyone who is not against us is for us. So Jesus is quite clear. Anyone who does things in his name must be allowed to proceed. Now this episode explains the choice of the first reading of today's Mass. As you know, the first reading is chosen because in one way or another it complements the Gospel. So the first reading comes from the book of Numbers, and it tells about an incident that occurred during the Exodus. The people were constantly complaining to Moses about one thing after another. All of a sudden, slavery in Egypt didn't seem so bad. Moses, in turn, complains to God, I cannot carry all these people on my own. The weight is too much for me. So God then offers a solution. He tells Moses to gather 70 of the elders of Israel and bring them to the tent of meeting. Now, the tent of meeting was like a portable temple. It was the dwelling place of God among his people until such time as the temple was eventually built in Jerusalem. God tells Moses that he'll take some of the spirit which is on him and put it on them. In that way, they will help him bear the burden of leading the people. Moses will no longer have to do it on his own. So today's first reading tells us that the Spirit did come down upon the elders gathered in the tent of meeting. But not all 70 of them were present in the tent. Two were missing. The two missing elders were Eldad and Medad. They were not present in the tent when the Spirit came down, but they nevertheless began to prophesy in the camp. Now Joshua, who's to become the successor of Moses, is put out by this. He appeals to Moses, my Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous on my account? If only the whole people of Israel were prophets, and the Lord gave his spirit to them all. So Moses and Jesus are each saying to their followers something like this. Get rid of your own sense of distinctiveness and privilege and be prepared to find and rejoice in goodness wherever it exists. The fact that God has chosen you doesn't mean that you also have an exclusive monopoly in carrying out the work of God in the world. Let's spend a few moments reflecting on some other sayings of Jesus in today's Gospel. Sayings that seem harsh and uncompromising. Cut off your hand if it should cause you to sin. Cut off your foot if it should cause you to sin. And tear out your eye if it should cause you to sin. Now, these drastic measures are clearly not meant to be carried out in a literal sense. Jesus is talking about the supreme value of life in the kingdom of God. God's kingdom is of such overriding importance that we must be prepared to act vigorously against anything in our lives that would jeopardize our life in God's kingdom. Now, if the image of Cutting off sounds too harsh. Let's use the gentler image of letting go. What must I let go of? One popular story tells of an effective way to catch a monkey. If you place something a monkey wants, perhaps some enticing food, inside a container, the monkey will reach in to get the food. But the container must be nailed down or chained up so that the monkey can't take it away. The opening in the container must be just wide enough for the monkey to get its hand through. But once the monkey has grasped the food within the container, it can't get its hand out. The monkey is imprisoned by its own unwillingness to open its fist and let go of the food. So what? On my journey of discipleship, 
do I need to let go of? Let's change the metaphor once more. Not chopping off, nor letting go, but opening the door. Let me turn to a famous painting that you've probably seen reproduced many times. It's this painting by Holman Hunt that now hangs in St Paul's Cathedral in London. The painting is called The Light of the World, and it shows Jesus, lantern in hand, standing at a door, knocking. It's a reflection on a verse from the book of Revelation. Look, I am standing at the door, knocking. If one of you hears me calling and opens the door, I will come in to share a meal at that person's side. Now the painter himself pointed out that the door, overgrown with ivy, has no handle on the outside and could therefore be opened only from the inside. This, said Hunt, represented the obstinately shut mind. The painting was displayed in Australia in 1906 and was viewed by four million people. Now, the population of Australia was only five million people at that time. So that means that four out of every five people in this country saw the painting. When, many years later, the painting was restored, it was taken out of its frame and the art restorers saw something that no one was intended to see. On a part of the canvas wrapped around the frame, the artist had written the words, Forgive me, Lord Jesus, that I kept you waiting so long. So, what do I have to cut off? What do I have to let go of? What door must I open to enter the kingdom of God? May the peace of Christ be with you. At times when we are angry with someone, we tend to blurt out the order, go to hell. No doubt we may not really mean what we are saying, but in that statement is bottled up all the anger and frustration with what the person has done or not done. That hell seems to be the best place we'd like that person to go. It's another way of telling the person that he is useless and we are disappointed with him. When we speak of hell, numerous images come to mind of blazing fire with creatures having horns and tails. And all these come from biblical imagery. But actually hell is not something that we have seen, nor smelt, nor felt. In today's gospel, when our Lord speaks of hell, he uses a word which we do not hear in the text because it was translated into English. He uses the word Gehenna, one of the words for hell. And when Jesus uses this word, all the Jews and the others in Jerusalem knew exactly what he was talking about. Gehenna was the ever-burning rubbish dump of Jerusalem where the municipal workers emptied all the garbage. So those who heard Jesus had seen the place, smelt it, and maybe were even standing in its smoke when he talked. They may have seen the worms crawling through that part of the place where the fire had not reached. And what usually goes into a rubbish dump? Food that is not eaten, that is spoiled, wrappings, waste, and so on. Things that we do not use, the things that have been broken, all the things that do not function anymore. So what our Lord Jesus was trying to say very simply was, if you are not useful in the kingdom of heaven or human life or family or the community, you need to be thrown in the rubbish dump of my kingdom or Gehenna. Our Lord always spoke of being useful in the world. 
his manifesto, which he announced in the temple at the beginning of his ministry, was all about being useful to God's people. Through the parable of the talents, he praised enterprise and hard work. In Matthew chapter 21, he curses the fig tree because it isn't useful. Today's readings exhort us to be useful. In the first reading, Moses appreciates Eldad and Medad because they were making themselves useful by prophesying. In the second reading, St. James strongly attacks the futility of collecting earthly treasures at the cost of kingdom values. In the Gospel, our Lord seems to be appreciating an outsider who is casting out demons in his name. Jesus appears harsh when he speaks of cutting off one's sinful limbs and eyes. There's a reason why he does this. He prefers that we use our faculties wisely for the spread of his kingdom. The message of today's liturgy is simple. Be useful even in the little things. Be useful at home, not just in fulfilling responsibilities, but also in maintaining peace and harmony. Strive to be of good use rather than a nuisance. Be useful in the parish to which you belong. Share your time and resources for the good of the community. The parish always has numerous opportunities to serve in the Lord's name. Be useful in your relationships. Be useful in your work as you use your God-given talents and serve in different ways. Hell is no place for people who are useful and helpful. Let hell be the last place we'd like to go to. May none of us ever find ourselves in a rubbish dump of life. Amen. Do we ignore discipleship? From Isn't It Funny? Contributed by L.M. Myers funny how a $20 bill looks so big when you take it to church, but so small when you take it to the mall. Funny how big an hour serving God looks, and how small 60 minutes are when spent watching television, playing sports, sleeping, or taking a lunch break. Funny how long a couple of hours spent at church are, but how short they are when watching a good movie. Funny how we get thrilled when a football game goes into overtime, but we complain when a sermon is longer than the regular time. Funny how laborious it is to read a chapter in the Bible, and how easy it is to read two to three hundred pages of a best-selling novel. Funny how we believe what newspapers say, but question what the Bible says. Funny how people scramble to get the front seat at a concert but scramble to get the back seat at the church service. Funny how we cannot fit a gospel meeting into our schedule with our yearly planner, but we can schedule for other events at a moment's notice. Funny how we look forward to a big date on Friday night, but complain about getting up for church on Sunday morning. Funny how we are rarely late for work, but always late for church. Funny how we call God our Father and Jesus our brother, but find it hard to introduce them to others. Funny how small our sins seem, but how big other people's sins are. Funny how we demand justice for others, but expect mercy from God. Funny how much difficulty some have learning the gospel well enough to tell others but how simple it is to understand and explain the latest gossip about someone else. Funny how we can't think of anything to say when we pray, but don't have any difficulty thinking of things to talk about to a friend. Funny how we are so quick to take directions from a total stranger when we are lost, but are hesitant to take God's direction for our lives. Funny how people want God to understand their prayers, but refuse to listen to his counsel. Funny how we sing about heaven, but live only for today. Funny how people think they are going to heaven, but don't think there is a hell. 
funny. It is okay to blame God for evil and suffering in the world, but it is not necessary to thank Him for what is good and pleasant. Funny how when something goes wrong, we cry, Lord, why me? But when something goes right, we think, hey, it must be me. Or wait, maybe all this isn't so funny after all. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. My dear friends, the complexity in this passage of the first reading, however, requires more interpretative subtlety. The wilderness, which becomes a metaphorical place of God's testing in the Bible, is the locus for both human and divine difficulty. This harsh setting challenges both the Israelites and their God. Position in the middle of the conflict is Moses, who intercedes on behalf of the people in the face of God's judgment. Thus, the wilderness becomes the place in which covenantal loyalty is lived out and tested for all parties involved, the Israelites, Moses and the Lord. Moses is characterized as the Israelite prophet par excellence. Individuals who challenge Mosaic authority suffer harsh consequences. However, even within this type of centralized authority, the most iconic in the Bible, there is a series of checks and balances for human leadership. This passage contains an example in which Moses, the great liberator of the Israelites, cannot bear the people's burdens by himself. Moreover, when Joshua tries to limit the spirit of prophecy that has fallen on Eldad and Medad, Moses rebukes him, responding with a statement that decentralizes authority. There is no certain way to secure the end of the story within the drama of covenantal loyalty. However, the righteous are called to stand faithfully with God's people in the wilderness, even in the face of the Lord's anger. In the letter of St. James, we hear the author calling out to people to weep and know that their riches and love for material goods is rusting their lives. The suppressed cause to the poor, the slaves, the servants, and those who have labored for them have cried out for help to God, and the Lord has been generous enough to pay heed to their cries. The innocent and righteous Man is killed by you, and yet he did not resist. In the Gospel passage, Jesus retorts, saying, Have salt in yourself. Be at peace with each other. Why don't we have peace in our lives? First, we do not have peace in our lives because we fight to protect our own territory. Jesus encountered this in his disciples. He was driving out demons and he was doing this in your name. Now we know that he has not been trained like we have. He has not been chosen as we have. So we told him to stop. The disciples wanted to protect their turf, maintain control, but Jesus had a better way. They were to be the facilitators, not manipulators of a new kingdom. 
If others come along with gifts and talents, do not hinder them. In Jesus' words, whoever is not against us is for us. Second, we do not have peace in our lives because we destroy the weak among us. Jesus says, be like salt, preserve what is best. If others are working for the kingdom, don't stop them. Those who follow me and are weak, the children, the defenseless, the poor, protect them. Make sure that they too have peace in their lives. Preserve what is good by being at peace. Peace between God and man. Peace between one another. And third, we do not have peace in our lives because we will not let go of that which destroys us. Drastic sins call for drastic measures. We should be so intent and eradicating sin that we will cut out, remove any stumbling block. If you cannot control your addiction to pornography, cut off your internet connection. If you cannot live a chaste life, end the relationship. Cut it off. Shut it down. Turn it off. Say goodbye. Sin is radical and it must be dealt with in radical ways. Let us seek for his assistance to be true followers with radical change in our lives. Amen. Have you ever been entrusted with a task that you thought was too much, that you didn't have the capabilities to do what was being asked of you? I know in my own life, I felt that many times, that God had asked me to do something that I didn't think I had the capabilities to do. I think that this week's readings remind us that it's not us that are doing the work, that it's God's Spirit in us. When I was in high school, I was asked to give a talk, a testimony, at a conference where there's 2,000 people. At the time, I wasn't used to speaking in front of people, and so I didn't feel like I had what it took to do the job. And a leader came to me and she said, ask the Holy Spirit. She took that time and she prayed with me. She prayed, come Holy Spirit. And that was a valuable life lesson for me, that whenever I feel like I don't have what it takes, that I could turn to the Lord. I could ask the Lord for His help. The talk went well. And in fact, I remember thinking, gosh, that's not me. That's totally God's work. This week's readings remind us of that. In, this, in the first reading, we hear Moses. He's confronted by his disciple, who says to him, two men are prophesying. And he basically tells them to stop, to make them stop. And I love what Moses says. Moses says, would that the Lord might bestow his spirit on them all. And you and I have received that gift. That was fulfilled at Pentecost. God bestowed His Spirit on us all. So this week, as you think of the task that God has entrusted to you, as you think of what God wants you to do, remember that He's bestowed His Spirit on you. And not just for the tasks, but even in your daily walk with God, in your journey, in your struggles, God has given you His Spirit. This week, let us be reminded and pray the prayer, Come Holy Spirit. So let's pray that prayer together. Come Holy Spirit. Amen.
that nothing in this world can ever take us from his love. If God is for us. the Oh 